Okay, so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the DeFord Lecture Series. My name is Elizabeth Catlos and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. We're part of the Jackson School of Geosciences and the DeFord Lecture Series is our departmental seminar series. It's been a requirement and a tradition for all graduate students since the late 1940s. The lecture series is named after Professor Ronald DeFord who joined the university is a professor in 1948 with the purpose of enhancing the graduate program of the department. Our speaker will be introduced formally by Dr. David Morig, who is the Peter T. Flan Centennial Chair in Geology and Associate Dean of Research in the Jackson School of Geosciences. Thanks. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Davina Passeri who is a research oceanographer at the US Geological Survey. And her research really focuses on modeling the evolution of coastal systems, looking at the flow of both water and, and solids and how the shorelines and barrier islands that make up our, our coastal system evolve in response to changes in, in both of those. And then those model results are used to really are put into practice. They help guide, provide the information to guide management decisions. So uh, Dr. Passeri is a engineer by training. She got her uh, BS in civil engineering at the University of Notre Dame, and then her PhD in, in civil engineering as well from the University of Central Florida. Uh, coastlines are sort of, in my view, ground zero for looking at environmental change. They're very susceptible to sea level rise, to climate change, and to land use practice decisions that we're making. And the sort of modeling that we're going to hear about today is critical to understanding how these shorelines and particularly barrier islands uh, respond to those decisions and those environmental forcings. So with that, uh, we're very happy to have you here. Uh, please take it away. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this lecture series. Uh, I was super bummed out that this couldn't be done in person because I absolutely love Austin, uh, especially the food and the barbecue, but I'm glad that I still have the opportunity to share my research with you all today. Um, as David mentioned, my background is in numerical modeling, particularly looking at the effects of sea level rise in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And so today I'm going to talk about how we can use models to look at decadal barrier island evolution under future storms and sea level rise. So first, let's think about where the land meets the sea. About 27% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of a shoreline and at an elevation lower than 100 meters. And alongside these human communities, we have estuaries that provide food, shelter, and nursery areas for a variety of species. They also protect coastal communities during storm events by uh, dampening wave energy and mitigating storm surge and in inundation. Coastal hazards pose a risk to these communities in the form of inundation during extreme storms, shoreline erosion, and wetland loss. And in the future, all of these effects are expected to be exacerbated under global climate change and sea level rise in particular. And so my research is really focused on how we can use predictive models to better understand future changes to our coastlines and make them more resilient to hazards. When we think about coastal hazards, there is a time component that we have to consider. So on the short term, we have storms that really drive coastal change. Dunes are the first line of defense against storm-induced water levels. And as water levels exceed dune heights, sand gets transported. So if our water levels are confined uh, just to the beach beneath the base of the dune, then we'll just have minor sand eroded on the beach. As water levels start to approach the dune base, then we might see erosion of the front of the dune with collision and that sand gets transported and deposited offshore. If the water levels exceed the crest of the dune, we'll have overwash with sand transported and deposited onto the back barrier. And on barrier islands, if water levels get high enough, then the entire island can become inundated 
at which point we might see onshore or offshore uh, transport of sand. Also with inundation comes the potential of breaching. And so you can see that in the images to the right here. Um, this is at Fire Island after Hurricane Sandy, which caused a breach in that inlet to form. Now over the period of months to years, um, beaches typically recover from these storm effects. We can also think about longer term coastal hazards. And so for that, we have to consider sea level rise. And when we think about the effects of sea level rise, it's important to recognize that the coast does not behave like a bathtub, meaning that we're not just gonna have inundation of present day shorelines, but instead these higher water levels will allow waves to act further on the shore, which is gonna reshape our coastal morphology. That will also have feedbacks to our back bay, estuary, and marsh environments. And so we need to incorporate these dynamic interactions and feedbacks between coastal processes into our sea level rise assessment to get a more holistic understanding of what the coast might look like in the future. So the project that I'm gonna talk about today is the Alabama Barrier Island Restoration Assessment. This was done in collaboration between the state of Alabama, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, the Army Corps of Engineers and the USGS. And the focus was at Dauphin Island, which is a low lying barrier island that sits off the Alabama coast between the Mississippi Sound and the Gulf of Mexico. Dauphin Island is home to about 2,400 property owners, also the Audubon Bird Sanctuary, and has some cultural resources of value too, including the historic Fort Gaines and the Shell Mountain Park. And this is a very dynamic area, um, Dauphin Island and the broader Mississippi Sound. And so we can see that if we look historically. So this figure here is showing um, the thymetry circa 1848, along with the 1848 shoreline in black. You can see Dolphin Island on the eastern part of the Mississippi Sound. So at this point of time, uh, the island wasn't as elongated as it is presently. It sits next to Petty Boy Island, so there was a small inlet that separated the two. And if we look forward, this is in 1917, um, we can see Dolphin was breached at this point in time by a hurricane. Petty Boy had migrated significantly westward, so there's natural uh, westward alongshore transport that affects this just from the natural tide uh, and wave forces in the Mississippi Sound. And so that really separated Dauphin from Petty Boy and increased the width of that inlet there. Here we fast forward to 1960, so we can see that Dolphin had reconnected, that breach had reconnected. Petty Boy continued to migrate westward and that inlet wide widened between the two islands. And at this point in time, the shipping channels were put into place. And so this is the Pascagoula shipping channel here that actually anchors the western end of Petty Boy and prevents it from moving any further west, although the eastern end will continue to erode. Here's the 1960 shoreline in green on top of the present day aerial imagery. And you can see that Dolphin is just continuing to migrate westward, this western spit is continuing to accrete sand. As we saw with the historic uh, data, Dolphin is really affected by storm events, and that's because it has very low elevation. So the dunes are on the order of one to three meters here, so it doesn't take much for the dunes to become overtopped. And you can see that um, in a lot of these images here, this, this is different storms that have affected Dolphin Island. So on the left, the top image was taken in 2001. The middle was after Hurricane Ivan in 2004, which caused extensive overwash on the island. And then the bottom was a year later in 2005 after Hurricane Katrina came through. And Katrina actually breached the island, cut it into two, it bisected it and caused a lot of these localized channels to be formed that you can see in that bottom image. You can see the breach a little bit more clearly in the images in the middle here. So the top left was Hurricane Ivan. So these breaches in the center of the island actually started to form from Ivan, um, but then Katrina was a much more powerful storm and just came through and really widened that breach. The breach uh, stayed in the island through 2008. So that's the bottom 
two images here. Um, and then the bottom right was after hurricanes Gustav and Ike, which again caused a lot of overwash. When the Deepwater Horizon oil spill um, happened in 2010, a year after that, the Army Corps came in and created uh, this rock wall that you can see on the bottom right. And so the purpose of this rock wall is not only to reattach the island, but also to trap sand in front and try to reconnect the island. So the objective of the Alabama Barrier Island Restoration Assessment was to look at different restoration options for Dolphin Island to increase the island's sustainability, but also to restore the vital habitats for species affected by the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And so this project really started out um, by collecting field data to understand the present state of the island. That data was also used as input to a suite of integrated models uh, that describe the morphologic evolution, water quality, and also habitats across the island. The output from the models was used to form a decision analysis framework that could inform different management actions to align with management objectives. We then took each of those management actions and plugged them back into our models and reran the models to see how the outputs would change with those particular restoration scenarios. All of that get, got fed back into the decision analysis framework and the ultimate outcome was guidance and strategies for restoration on the island. This project required an interdisciplinary project team. Uh, this was made up of coastal engineers, oceanographers, biologists, ecologists, and geologists. And as you can see, there were quite a few people involved in this study. It was a five-year project, and we had um, multiple centers within both USGS and the Army Corps of Engineers. All right, so as I mentioned, the first component of this project was the field data collection campaign. And there was a variety um, of field data that was collected, including sediment cores to look at the variability of sediment characteristics across the island. This was also used to parameterize our morphologic models. Um, we collected bathymetry that was used to understand recent changes in bed levels around the island, but also to have um, a present day digital elevation model for our initial inputs to the models. We collected water levels, waves, and currents for the purpose of model validation, and then habitat distribution and characterization that was used to provide baseline data for the habitat models. So as I mentioned, we really wanted to understand how the island would evolve in the future over decadal timescales. And so to do this, we developed this integrated modeling approach where we used um, three different models to describe uh, morphologic change during fair weather conditions and also during storm events. So we used Stealth 3D to simulate the alongshore sediment transport during quiescent conditions. So this is that westward um, alongshore transport that I mentioned is really influential in shoreline change. We used X-Beach to simulate our storm-induced beach and dune evolution. And then we used an empirical dune growth model called EDGAR for resolving our post-storm dune recovery. And so in the next few slides, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about each of these models and then how we integrated them together for decadal simulations. So DELF3D is a 2D process-based numerical model that simulates water levels, waves, sediment transport, and resulting bed level change. And the way that we used it for the project was to simulate alongshore sediment transport and shoreline change due to tides and waves um, during fair weather conditions across yearly time scales. You can see our model grid in the lower left uh, image here. And so our grid extended out to include Mobile Bay, the Mississippi Sound, and then the broader Gulf of Mexico. And we had a nested uh, higher resolution wave grid to resolve um, surf zone processes that 
affect sediment transport along the island. We validated the model um, using our collected field data of water levels, waves, and currents. And so we had um, about a six month period, two six month periods that we were able to validate against. And I'm showing a comparison of water levels um, on the top right figure here for one of the validation periods. This is modeled versus observed at the tide gauge that's located on the island. And we're getting a pretty good agreement here in our water levels with an R squared of about 0.68. Also, since we wanted to use this model to resolve shoreline change, we uh, wanted to validate it. And so to do that, we did a 10-year hindcast um, of shoreline change on the model, and we compared it with observed LIDAR data. So that's the bottom right figure here. So our modeled shoreline change over that 10-year time period um, is in the red. And then our measured from the LIDAR data is black. And what's important to note here is that we're generally matching the trends of shoreline change at these different locations across the island. So the second model we're using, again, is XBeach. Like uh, Delft3D, XBeach is also a 2D process-based numerical model that simulates water levels, waves, and morphologic change. But XBH is really focused on storm time scales. Um, and so it is able to resolve things like dune erosion, overwash, and breaching. So the subaerial morphologic change that happens during storm events, whereas Delft 3D, we're looking more at the subaqueous uh, fair weather sediment transport. So you can see um, our X beach grid on the right here, the figures on the right. It's a localized grid that just encompasses um, Dolphin Island. And when we made this model, we really wanted to be able to describe the physics as accurately as possible instead of tuning the model or calibrating it um, with specific parameters. And so to do that, um, part of our investigation was to do a sensitivity analysis where we looked at how sensitive the X speech model was to bottom friction parameterization. So for that sensitivity analysis, um, we ran two different scenarios. One, we applied a constant bottom friction coefficient to the entire grid. So there was one friction coefficient representing both land and water. And then a second scenario, where we parameterized spatially varying bottom friction. And so to do that, um, we use land cover data, which you can see on the bottom left here. So this figure is showing CCAP land cover data across the island. Um, the dominant land cover classes here are bare earth, that's the beaches um, on the front side, wetlands on the back barrier, some developed regions um, on the eastern side of the island, and also even some forested areas on the very widest part of the island on the east end there. We relied on the literature to assign friction coefficients to each of these land cover classes, and then we interp interpolated um, those friction coefficients onto our model grid. And so on the right, um, we did hindcasts of Hurricanes Ivan and Katrina to see how well our model was performing. Uh, this, these results are for Hurricane Katrina. These are the post-storm um, elevations. So the very top figure here are our observed um, Katrina elevations. And then in the middle, we have our scenario with the constant friction coefficient. And so you can see we're getting a lot of breaching that uh, does not match with our observed elevations. But when we did the spatially varying friction coefficient on the bottom here, we're actually matching a lot better. So we're not getting any more of that unrealistic breaching. And that's because we're applying these higher friction coefficients, particularly along the back barrier shorelines. Then the last model that we are using um, in our integrated modeling approach is uh, called EDGAR, so an empirical dune growth model. This was developed in-house at USGS. EDGAR is a 1D cross-shore empirical model based on the Hauser et al. dune growth model. 
It's operated on yearly time scales similar to Del 3D. And because it's an empirical model, um, it relies on having a lot of observed data to calibrate it. So for Dauphin Island, uh, it's a very data rich area. And so we had 14 ladder surveys um, spanning from 1998 all the way to 2018 that we were able to use to calibrate the model. So the way that the Edgar model works, um, the first step is that it fits out cross shore uh, transects of the island with a set of Gaussian curves. So that's the left figure here. So you have a single curve to represent the base of the island and then multiple Gaussians to fit out the berm and dune features of the island. So it's basically just doing curve fitting here um, with Gaussian curves to represent an island profile. The Edgar model then takes that initial profile and evolves the dune. Um, this is based on the Hauser dune growth curve, sigmoidal dune growth curve. And again, that's those growth rates are parameterized based on the LIDAR data. And then we took a simple uh, linear relationship to build out the width of the dune. So relating the dune height to the dune width. The model then takes those new dune um, heights and widths and fits them back into the fitted profile and comes up with a new profile. So that's operated again on this yearly time scale. So um, we want to use these models sequentially to do decadal simulations to understand how the island evolves, again, under our fair weather conditions and also during storm events. And so to do that, we run DELF3D for our uh, quiescent period. Those elevations, those bed level elevations get passed to our X-Beach model and we run X-Beach for um, our storm event. The post-storm elevations from X-Beach get passed to the Edgar model, which then will recover the dune um, for the same quiescent period that DELF3D is run. And then uh, those elevations get passed to DELF3D and the process continues. We wanted to look out um, in particular over a 10 year simulation period. Uh, so to do that, we had to come up with a climatology. And so one thing that we wanted to consider was variations in storminess, meaning uh, variations in the frequency and intensity of storms. And we're only looking at uh, historic variations in storminess, so we're not considering any future climate-driven changes that might change frequency or intensity. So to develop um, our storm climatology, the Army Corps uh, developed this Monte Carlo sampling method. And um, basically how this works is that tropical, the occurrence of tropical cyclones can be described with the Poisson distribution. So using that Poisson distribution with Monte Carlo sampling, we can generate year to year storm counts over our 10 year time interval. So that tells us how many storms we can expect each year over the 10 year time period. Each of those storms then gets assigned to a specific storm from the FEMA synthetic storm database. Um, and so that's the figure on the left, upper left here. These are synthetic storms um, that have a variety of different landfall locations, uh, different intensities, different durations. And so again, um, each of our storms is assigned to a specific um, storm here based on random selection and uh, the frequency of the occurrence for each of the storm events. So we ran this Mar Monte Carlo sampling um, 1,000 times to come up with 1,000 different realizations of storms over the 10-year period. And then we bin them based on island impact. So that's the bottom table here. Um, so each of these storminess bins, there's four of them, and each of the bins corresponds to um, the island response regimes that you see uh, above that that I talked about earlier. And so if you look across the storminess bins in the table, you can see that um, the number of storms increases in each of the bins, as well as the maximum water level. 
We also wanted to take into account future sea level rise. Uh, so we considered three different sea level rise scenarios, 30 centimeters, 50 centimeters, and one meter. So with our four storminess scenarios and our three sea level rise scenarios, we have a total of 12 scenarios that we're considering in our models. So here um, we are looking at the model output at the end of our 10 year simulation. So this figure here is showing island elevations. Um, and what in the red boxes here, I've, I've highlighted the scenarios where we've had breaches. And so as we move down the rows in this figure, we have scenarios of increased storminess. As we move across the columns, we have our scenarios of increased sea level. And so what you can see here for a given storminess scenario, say you look across the second row here, as we crank up sea level rise, um, we start to see that the island breaches uh, in the center, particularly around that rock wall that was constructed. Also, as you crank up storminess, um, you start to see more land loss. So if you look at that very bottom row there, that's the um, highest storminess scenario. And we're starting to see some significant amounts of erosion with the highest sea level scenario on the far right. Um, the island is completely drowning in just 10 years. We can use the model results to better understand how the island uh, behaves in response to storms and sea level rise. And so to do that, uh, we calculated the change in the island height and the change in the island width at the end of the 10-year simulation at crossshore transects across the entire island. And we found that the barrier island was exhibiting five different behaviors. So some of the transects were keeping pace meaning that the transects were maintaining their height and width through the 10 years. Some transects were experiencing aggradation, meaning that they were gaining height and width. Some were narrowing, meaning that they lost width, but they maintained or gained height. Some flattened, meaning they lost their height, but they maintained or gained width. And then some were deflating. So these were transects that lost both height and width. And so this figure here um, is showing uh, each of those behaviors uh, plotted spatially across the island uh, for our 12 different sea level rise or 12 different climato climatologic scenarios. So again, as you move across um, the columns here, we have our scenarios of increased sea level rise. And as we move down the rows, we have our scenarios of increased storminess. And so what you might first notice is under our lower storminess scenarios, the top two rows here, we see a lot more of the yellow color that's narrowing. And so since these are our lower storminess scenarios, um, we're not having water levels high enough that are overtopping the dunes but instead we see more collision. So sands being eroded from the face of the dune and transported and deposited offshore, which is why the transects are losing their width, but they're maintaining the height. We see more of the green color in our higher storminess scenarios. So the bottom two rows here and green is flattening. So since these are the more intense storms with the higher water levels, flattening is driven by overwash. Um, that's causing the dunes to lose their height, but the sand is getting deposited on the back barrier, so the island is still able to maintain or gain width. The dark blue color is deflation, and we see that across all of our scenarios. So with the lower storminess scenarios, when we have deflation, it's driven by dune avalanching. So again, um, our water levels are not overtopping the dune but they're eating away the face of the dune and the dune is collapsing on itself. So it's losing its height and that sand is getting deposited offshore. With the higher storminess scenarios where we do have overtopping, deflation uh, is being caused by overwash, but instead of the sand being deposited on uh, the back barrier, the flows um, in the storms are strong enough to completely push the sand into the back bay. 
What's also interesting is when deflation is our dominant uh, regime across our transects, the island breaches. Um, so again, the red boxes here highlight the scenarios where the island breaches and we see a lot of that dark blue color happening. So as I mentioned, when I talked about the objectives of this project, uh, the state of Alabama also wanted to um, look at different restoration options to restore the vital habitats that exist on the island. So um, a colleague of mine, Nicholas Enright, who also works at USGS at the Wetland and Aquatic Research, Research Center, developed a habitat model um, to look at how habitats would change across the island with the changing morphology. So he actually took the output from our morphologic models um, in terms of elevations and plugged them into this habitat model. So on the top uh, row here figures, this is showing habitats spatially across the island for a low storminess, low sea level rise condition. Um, and so the dominant habitats here are beach and dune. We have some marshes on the back barrier. And then if we look at the bottom figures here, this is under a high storminess and a high sea level rise scenario. This is one of the scenarios where the island breached. So we are losing a lot of our beach and dune habitats. Um, we're losing a lot of the back barrier marsh environments and instead we're gaining intertidal habitats. So the Army Corps then took the output from our morphologic models and our habitat models and used them to develop 23 different restoration measures that would be feasible for the island. And these restoration measures uh, were variations of offshore sand placement, beach and dune nourishment, back barrier and marsh restoration, and also land acquisition. The objectives with these restoration measures was to maximize the ecological function and coastal and marine resources, and also to minimize the social impacts and cost and the restoration benefit latency. So I'm gonna go through one example. Um, this is a beach and dune nourishment that was proposed for the island. So if you look at the figure on the upper left here, the proposed uh, nourishment area is that yellow highlighted area there. And so we took um, each of these restoration measures and plugged them back into the morphologic models. We changed our initial elevations, re-ran the models to see how that would affect island elevations over those, that same 10 year period and our same climatologic scenarios. So these figures on the top right here um, show our island elevations. Uh, the ones on the left are a low storminess and low sea level rise scenario. And on the right, we have a high storminess and a high sea level rise scenario. So with the lower storminess and sea level rise, uh, the restoration didn't really do much to change the island elevations. But where it really made a difference was with those higher storminess and sea level rise, it actually prevented the eastern part of the island from breaching. And so um, again, those island elevations were passed to the habitat model um, and the habitat model was rerun and they found with the restoration, it prevented loss of the beach, dune and intertidal flat and marsh habitats. So we had quite a bit of model output between the morphologic models and the habitat models. And we considered all of these different climatologic scenarios and all these different restoration scenarios. And so while that is meaningful to more technical people, um, we needed a way to allow our stakeholders to really look at the trade-offs between these restoration measures. And so to do that, um, a colleague of mine, Elise Irwin, who is also with USGS, the Alabama Co-op Unit, she developed um, this decision analysis framework uh, or structured decision-making to look at trade-offs between the different restoration measures and how they aligned with the multiple stakeholder objectives. 
This table here um, is showing the output of that structured decision making. Um, and so each of the restoration measures um, were ranked and the highest ranked restoration was this East End Beach and Dune restoration. So that's not the example that I just showed, um, but instead, if you look at the top right image here, it's Beach and Dune um, restoration on that very Eastern tip of the island highlighted in yellow. And this was the highest ranked restoration because it minimized impacts to freshwater wetlands, open freshwater and woody habitats. It had a low maintenance cost, a low impact to infrastructure, mostly because this area of the island is forested. It's not as inhabited as the sandy beach parts. And there also was a gain in critical habitat and Coastal Barrier Resource Act zone lands. This project was completed um, this past year in 2020. And since its completion, there is actually three projects that are moving forward for implementation. And so one is that Eastern End Beach and Dune restoration, but there's also going to be marsh restoration and borrow pit restoration. All right, so to summarize, uh, we can use numerical models to understand how the coast may evolve in the future under short and long term drivers. We saw that increased storminess and sea level rise will result in barrier island breaching and even drowning over decadal time scales. Restoration actions such as beach and dune nourishment may help prevent breaching, but they can be costly. And really this last bullet point is probably the most important takeaway from my talk, but understanding future, future coastal evolution requires interdisciplinary approaches. And so uh, with that, I will wrap up and take any questions. And thank you again for having me and allowing me to share my research with you all. Sean Gulick uh, says, great talk. And he was hoping that you would comment about the potential for using this suite of modeling tools at, in, at other locations. And in, in particular, do you have a wish list of key sites or locations that you would actually like to investigate? The entire goal. <laughs> 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 Not always feasible. Um, like I said, this was a five year study. So it was a big time investment to get these models developed and to run them. They're very computationally expensive when you're looking out at these decadal time scales. We are currently taking this model framework and expanding it to Petty Boy, um, the island next to Dolphin Island on the western side, to look at how that island evolves with Dolphin Island and then understand um, the, that offshore barrier island evolution and how it impacts the mainland coast and the estuaries and marshes that exist um, on Mississippi and Alabama. So we're doing it there. Uh, we also have plans to build out similar models at Santa Rosa Island um, in partnership with uh, the National Park Service. So um, especially after this past storm season, Hurricane Sally really affected um, that area as well as Perdido Key. So that's an upcoming project as well. Um, so maybe we'll get there one island at a time. Great. I think that is the last of the questions. Um, so that that may be the end. I want to I want to thank you again for the great presentation and and for the the thoughtful and thorough answers. So this this was great. Thank you very much, Davina. Thank you all for having me. Yeah, and thanks for coming. I'll end the talk now, and I hope to see everybody um, next Thursday. <laughs>